Um, so our next section is uh, at least the part that I'm going to handle is shotgun metagenomics, but the case study covers uh, three different uh, uh, methods in sequencing. Uh, shotgun metagenomics is a natural continuation of what we had just spoken about uh, with whole genome sequencing. Uh, this is essentially whole genome sequencing, but for an environmental sample, and I'll have a more detailed description as we get into it. Uh, first, I want to discuss uh, the case study that we'll be going over by uh, Zhu Zhao et al. Uh, and its uh, title is Non-Centropic Methanogenic uh, Hydrocarbon Degradation by an Archaeal Species. Uh, overall, uh, this paper describes a single archaeal species in detail uh, that is able to degrade hydrocarbons um, uh, by itself without a centropic interaction with a bacteria. So basically, um, uh, it, was, uh, it was thought that communities of bacteria uh, around, uh, uh, I'm sorry, uh, <laughs> ocean floor vents uh, on oily sludge, uh, that communities of bacteria could uh, do this methanogenic degradation of hydrocarbons, basically breaking down hydrocarbons uh, and making methane while they do it. Uh, but the community was required, uh, and these researchers found that that's not necessarily the case. So a little bit of background. We're going to be talking about archaea. Uh, again, not an archaeal expert, but a little bit of background. Uh, these are single-celled organisms that are distinct from eukarya and prokarya. Uh, they've got some uh, biochemical differences and, and uh, metabolic differences that make them very distinct. Uh, they are just well known for being our extremophiles, right? I just said that we're going to be talking about a case study that's studying an archaea from the ocean floor by a methane vent. Uh, and so these are um, extreme organisms that live in extreme places. And because of that, they're interesting to study because of uh, uh, they're going to have some extreme enzymes with interesting properties. Right? Uh, archaea play important roles in cycling elements in our ecosystems. Uh, and in these uh, kind of uh, niche environments where things, uh, uh, in extreme environments uh, where it's either highly acidic, uh, highly uh, high salinity, high temperature, low temperature, uh, this is where you'll find them. Uh, so I got into a little bit of the terminology, but I'd just like to uh, uh, define this in case it comes up again as we go through this part of the PowerPoint. Uh, so non-centropic methanogenic degradation, uh, put simply, uh, this is taking hydrocarbons from oily sludge, um, uh, from plastics, uh, wherever you would find a hydrocarbon, uh, it, it being taken up into an organism. In this case, we're going to be talking about uh, mostly archaea uh, and degrading that hydrocarbon, breaking it down into methane and producing methane. And hydrocarbon degradation, uh, we're taking hydrocarbons and, and breaking them down. So long chain hybrid hydrocarbons, complex hydrocarbons, uh, and breaking them down and oxidizing them into smaller subunits. Uh, so the study objective, I kind of touched on it in the beginning. It was to investigate this archaeal species uh, that could break down, um, uh, break down uh, these hydrocarbons itself. Uh, before it was seen that the communities of microbes could break down the oily sludge and produce methane while they do it. Of course, this is important because it has impacts in uh, bioremediation and environmental. Uh, science, but uh, these researchers use next generation sequencing uh, to analyze the actual genomic um, content of the community sample and found that uh, the party responsible for this methanogenic degradation was the archaeal species, not the bacterial species. I'm going to jump back really quick to this image, but this is a uh, this is exposure to hexadecane, uh, where we can see that uh, the uh, upon exposure to he hexadecane, uh, the green is archaea, the red is bacteria, uh, and you can see that the bacteria make up a very small fraction of the community in the oily sludge, um, and this was also reflected in their shotgun metagenomic sequencing data too. So that's uh, some of the power of shotgun metagenomics as we get into it. Um, so like I described, shotgun metagenomics is a natural continuation from our whole genome sequencing um, uh, method. Uh, th in this case, though, we are working with environmental samples, right? So this is not going to be a, a clean culture. This is not going to be a single strain. Uh, this is going to be an environmental sample, and environment includes the gut, a stool, hair uh, samples from hair and skin that have microbial communities living in them. Um, 
Most microbes cannot be cultured in isolation. And so the ability to take these community samples, uh, break them down, extract their gDNA, and sequence it using shotgun metagenomics uh, is a powerful way not only to identify what is there and who is there, uh, but also what genes are enriched in that sample. What is the function of those genes? And what is the functional potential of that community? Uh, so one of the challenges for performing a shotgun metagenomic sequencing experiment uh, is the type of sample that you'll be working with. I just mentioned some of these samples. Up on this slide are some guidelines on how to deal with these samples. But understanding your sample is a really key first step. Uh, with soil, are you working with silty soil, clay soil, loamy so soil, et cetera? Um, for the gut, uh, pay, paying attention to what you're actually targeting. Um, when you're trying to collect stool sample uh, and trying to observe the, the uh, microbiota in the stool versus that might, that, um, which might be on the lining of the intestine um, and, and make, taking care not to get too much host contamination because shotgun metagenomics, as powerful as it is, it's going to look at everything in the sample. So being selective and, and if effective when you go to uh, isolate your gDNA uh, it will help you clean up your downstream analysis and help you target your findings. Um, I think that's most of what I have to say, but Charles, if you want to jump in. Yeah, no, I think that you said it correctly. I mean, it just depends uh, really what system we're working in and what the limitations of the system are, right? And then the ability for the genomic or uh, transcriptomic information to maintain itself before it gets to the sequencer. So, the kit that you use to extract your samples is going to depend on what you're extracting. Uh, this slide is just a little bit of information on some of the common methods, uh, but really the point that I want to make is this. Uh, the extraction is important, uh, the method is important, but it's also important to have uh, as clean of a sample as you can get when you start to extract from it. Uh, you could have the perfect kit, but if you don't, uh, if you have mostly um, particulate from your soil, or if there's any kind of uh, interfering component uh, in your sample that might affect the way the reagents of your kit will actually work, um, this is going to be a problem. Uh, the other side of that coin is that when you clean up your sample, right, you filter out sediment or uh, you make the water a little bit less turbid, um, when you do this, you lose a little bit of that gDNA that you'd otherwise collect. And so shotgun metagenomic sequencing and the extraction that leads, to, leads up to it it's kind of a dance between how much sample am I willing to lose to clean up the sample versus what is the, the um, uh, how clean is it for the method that I want to use. Uh, so this is kind of a dance and I highly recommend just whoever's doing your sequencing and is prepping your library, uh, talk to them first, talk to them about the sample. They probably have a lot of uh, experience uh, isolating from many sample types. So anything else you wanna? Good. Okay. Yeah, we, we kind of talked about uh, this for a, a brief moment, um, but one, this is more of a, a slide to uh, distinguish shotgun metagenomics from a service that we're going to talk about later. Uh, when you're sampling for shotgun metagenomics, if you're interested in the microbiota, the microbiome, uh, sample for that and avoid host contamination as much as possible. If that's not possible, you may need to consider other methods. And later on, we'll get into Amplicon shotgun metagenomic sequencing where you're targeting specific genetic regions um, and also PCR product sequencing for other things like viruses. Okay, this one's big. Yeah. Uh, negative controls. Why do we need them? Uh, so they ensure the specificity and the, they reduce false negatives, right? Or sorry, false positives. Uh, they detect contamination and they improve data quality. They help validate the results and ensure the accuracy, and they help facilitate troubleshooting. So negative controls, why are they needed? Uh, they're especially needed in microbial studies. Depending on the system we're working in, let's take a freshwater example. Uh, I want to extract the microbes in the water. Um, where do I start my negative control at? Some people will start their negative control uh, at the vessel that they use to collect it. Was it autoclave? Was it not autoclave? Who did it handle? Who handled it? Take a negative control all the way from the beginning, two separate columns or two separate bottles, 
uh, one has bonotoclave, one has not bonotoclave, treated, untreated, you can start there. You can move further up the line uh, and go to um, positive uh, contaminant. So if you have a uh, known species that you think is uh, in the system, or even if it's not, you can spike the one of the controls as this is present, is it present? If it is present in my negative control, then there may be an issue. Uh, library construction. So when you send your samples, like I said, you can choose the Navy control at any point up until sequencing. Uh, this can happen at many stages. When you send it to your sequencer, a couple things you might want to think about. Cost, for sure, uh, and uh, reliability. Service providers will generally take your sample, perform a quality control on it. Then the client will then choose whether or not to proceed. Ideally, you should push a negative control through the quality control step, even if this is just the EPC, uh, to be sure that your bench working sample doesn't contain any microbes. We can then even, you know, theoretically that should come back with nothing. It should be a zero result, right? There's nothing in there, hopefully. You can push it further if you want. You can go through library construction uh, and you can pause there. You can do a quality control and you can look for an incorporation of a transcript or a uh, genomic insert. If no genomic insert, then you're more or less assured that there is nothing off target in there. If you want to push it even further, you can sequence it. We do run into some of the issues that Kyle mentioned uh, in terms of index hopping and uh, adapters, free floating. Most, uh, so this is a limitation on the high seq on the Nova 6000. This is pre filtered, uh, so it's not the largest concern. Uh, so, really, your negative controls can come from any time point throughout your experiment. Keep in mind at what point should you stop? In my opinion, the safest place to stop is library construction. It is more expensive, but you know for sure if there's any genomic or transcriptomic information in your sample. So we touched on replicates. Um, the, the main point that I want to make on the slide is because of the variability in one sampling and two, the actual distribution of your microbes in your sample, you can kind of treat shotgun metagenomic sequencing. If you're familiar with RNA-seq as a method, you can kind of treat it like RNA sequencing. You need similar numbers of replicates uh, to validate whether or not something is being uh, upregulated in your sample versus downregulated. Is it actually uh, representative of the community that you're looking at? Uh, these are two different categories of sample and three replicates is a pretty good uh, number across the board to shoot for. Um, just a little bit about um, what shotgun metagenomic sequencing looks like overall. Uh, and we can even tie this back to the case study. So you take your um, environmental sample. Uh, in this case, they were working with sludge um, from methane vents. Um, you take that sludge sample and you extract the DNA from it using the recommended kit. Uh, that DNA is fragmented. Uh, and this is there's no selection at this step. There's no a depletion or amplification, you take exactly what is in the sample, uh, you extract it and you prepare a library from it, like we discussed before, very similar to the whole genome sequencing library, it's actually pretty much identical. Um, but the key here is that everything gets captured. Uh, this includes, um, you know, eukaryotes, prokaryotes, archaea, um, and, and even viral sequences too, if they're in a DNA form, they can be captured in the library. Um, it's then sequenced on a, on a platform, could be um, PacBio, could be Nanopore, could be Illumina, it's, it depends on what your goal is. Uh, these uh, reads are then assembled kind of de novo um, with, uh, amongst themselves. So consensus sequences are overlapped uh, if there are no, seem to be from the same species and have the same sequence. Um, and then from there, the contigs are formed and these contigs uh, should map to some organism's reference genome. Uh, and these contigs are mapped against a database of those reference genomes. And so from there, you can call um, what is in my sample, the abundance of my species. Uh, and then if you're interested in the functional capability of your community, uh, then the abundance of genes, what genes are being up and down regulated in your sample. As I mentioned, uh, the pipeline is pretty much identical to what we talked about before natural continuation of whole genome sequencing. Uh, it's just in this case, when you take your sample, it's all the GDNA in the sample. Nothing's being isolated and cultured. 
uh, you've got kind of a messy sample and you're, that's what you're interested in. You're looking for uh, what is in here. It's a discovery mission. And then you also want to see uh, what are the genes that are important in this sample. Uh, in the context of this case study, uh, they used this, uh, they used this uh, process to one, uh, quantify uh, re relatively how much of each organism was in the sample. They found that there was not a lot of bacteria. There was a lot of archaea and specifically one species of archaea. And then when they dug into the sequence of that highly abundant archaea, it had two enzymes that were key in doing this uh, methanogenic degradation of hydrocarbons. And so uh, with a few other uh, experiments, they kind of proved that uh, this archaea itself was responsible for that degradation process. And so now we have uh, our species that's important. And then even within that species, we've identified two genes that are very important to the actual uh, metabolic process that we're observing. So shotgun metagenomics, very powerful. Uh, and generally speaking, this is how it's done. Once you get the data, this is how it is analyzed. A lot of the steps are going to look familiar from whole genome sequencing. Uh, everything in the beginning is the same. Raw data is quality control. Uh, we get clean data. Uh, it changes a little bit here where we have to assemble the reads amongst one another so that we make those contigs, right? Uh, we take reads that have share consensus sequence and layer them on one another. Uh, we build it then a contig that should be from the same organism and a contiguous gene sequence from one organism. Uh, and then those contigs are then uh, assembled against many reference genomes from a database. Uh, so uh, reference genomes that are available. Um, uh, and it really depends what you call. It depends on the database that you use. So we use several, but uh, there's uh, many of them out there. Um, gene prediction. Uh, this is uh, uh, where we predict the function of the genes and what they are. Uh, and then we build a non-redundant gene catalog. Uh, and then we go through our taxonomic annotation where we look at what is in the sample, who, what are our species, uh, and then our functional annotation of, okay, what genes did we find? And now what are they doing? Let's compare them against databases of uh, genes with known metabolic functions and annotation. All right. Um, and then, of course, you can look at pathway enrichment and, and do your chrono analysis and uh, principal component analysis, different statistical and pathway views of your samples. Uh, what is important uh, in your sample at that time. 